What's up to all my fellow book lovers? My name is Ian, and on this channel, we break down some of the greatest books and ideas of all time. But today, we are here to have some literary fun and do a literature genre tier ranking challenge. So I've been receiving some great comments, and I've been laughing so hard because I've been pissing people off with some of these tier ranking challenges. People are like, why would you give that an F? I'm unsubscribing. You have no idea what's going on. And today, I'm going to be giving you guys all the tea on literature genres and the people who read them. And I'm sure I might piss, I'm sure we're going to piss off some more people today because I feel like what you read really reflects who you are, input, output. So let's get into it. So in 2022, literary fiction, which is option number one right here, which is we're going to call fiction. I still feel like literary fiction is the greatest field of art that has the most potential for play. I was reading Haruki Murakami last night and I couldn't believe how good some of the writing was i was like how do you get this how do you get to this level it takes tens of thousands of hours tens of thousands of hours of practice and understanding the human experience to you know put everything together and setting and dialogue there's so many different elements and that's why literary fiction is going to get an s it has to be at the top it still has so much potential even though we're not using that potential and people are saturating the market and every, everything that's wrong with literary fiction today it's still there are still so many winners every single year so many great books that get published. Next, we have nonfiction. And I'm a little bit iffy on nonfiction, and I'll tell you why, but I think nonfiction for sure receives an A. Once again, the market is so saturated now that there are so many non, nonfiction is a very broad topic, but I feel I still feel that if you want to progress in the world, if you want to change your life, for instance, and make more money or help more people or get um, be happier. Nonfiction has basically everything that you need. And if you maybe go to Library Genesis or somewhere, if you're in poverty and get all the books you need to need for free, you can change your life. And that's why nonfiction is so important. Sometimes it becomes campy. Sometimes it gets a little bit weird. There's a lot of repeating in nonfiction. That's why I'm getting giving it an A. There are a lot of ideas, much like fiction, you know, stealing like an artist is important, but a lot of books are getting rehashed, especially in the productivity, the emotional, the spiritual uh, nonfiction world that I like to read read in a lot. A lot of the ideas are rehashed all of the time. So next on the list, and if you guys disagree with me, let me know down in the comments. Let me know what you guys think, how you guys feel. If you guys don't know, on this channel, we do huge book breakdowns sometimes. I have four four to five hour book breakdowns, and I plan to do hundreds of hundreds more talking about talking to writers, talking about ideas. So subscribe to the channel, but let's talk about biographies, everybody. So I have a three prong system of judgment for these genres today. First is how I feel about it. Second is the present market of these books, of this genre. What is being, being put out now mostly in this genre? And then third, the historical nature of the genre. So next we have biography. And I enjoy biographies. I feel like they have a very good historical nature, but I feel like the current biography market falls a little bit flat. So I'm going to throw biography in the B section because there's so much to learn from biography. We have biographies. We have such big egos. We think that we can get everything we need from a couple personal personal development websites or just reading a couple clips about people's lives. But sometimes when you read someone's life from point A to point from A to Z and you realize how they lived and you, these little nuances and it gives you the full picture. It gives you like I said a theme. It's not just these little hacks or tips and we want to get these little take all the best hacks and tips and try to implement them into our own life. But sometimes you have to change the hue or understand what type of life you're living in, what aligns with that. And a lot of people, I feel like there's a couple of different ways people read biographies. Sometimes it's just a way to pass time or, you know, you want to read about someone that you enjoy or it's a historical thing. Like, for instance, I'm on the slow journey that will take a couple decades of reading a, a biography of every single president of the United States. But I mostly read biographies and love biographies or autobiographies for the magic they can bring to my own life. All the different ways that they inform and reflect and help me grow as an individual. So that's why they get to be. And that's why I would recommend you checking out some biographies of people that you really enjoy to see what they did. And it can inspire you. I've read a ton of biographies of, I just finished one on Frank Herbert, uh, excuse me, Frank Herbert, the science fiction author of Dune. So next we have classics. I'm going to give classics a, you know, I'm going to give classics an A because I, they are so, the classics are so underrated. People aren't, the problem is now is that people aren't even smart enough to read the classics. People are, you know, the reading rate is declining and that's one thing. 
But when people aren't even smart enough, when a lot of the people who are still reading aren't even smart enough to read the classics, then that's even a bigger problem. And the classics are sometimes very hard to read. The canon is a challenge. It is a, you have to, it feels like you're shooting yourself through a canon sometimes while reading the canon. Sorry for the bad joke. But the classics, uh, C.S. Lewis said that every book, every two or three new books you read, you should read a classic. And that's what I try to follow. That a book pre-1900, I try to read a book from pre-1900 every single, every three books I read that are more modern. And it really has impacted my life. It really has given me this huge historical broadness that a lot of people don't have, you know, when getting multiple English degrees, I would, I would be so surprised that, that so many kids had no idea about what was happening. Always, there's always those nerds, but you know, that nerds have read everything and they've read all the classics, but just piecing things together. If you're interested in knowledge, you need to piece together history. That's one of the things that people also don't realize and we'll talk about that in the history section that you want to piece together the history of literature to understand literature today, that you need to kind of understand the full broad spectrum if you want to understand it at a very deep level. And that's really when the game starts. I don't know if has anyone ever played like an MMO RPG or something. I used to play RuneScape. And what they say is that, you know, you grind out all these skills. You spend a thousand hours to max out your character. But that's when the game actually really starts because now you have full access to play. You, you are the strongest you have the strength now to play the game at its fullest. That's how I feel about the classics, that you really need to read all of them to really be able to think and feel about literature in general. It's like the prerequisite to having an opinion about literature. And I'm not there yet either. And I'm talking about like a very high degree level, you know, very high degree opinion. So next we have comedy. And I'm going to throw comedy at the level of... We're going to give comedy a D. I have read a couple comedy books in the in the literature genre, but I don't really see the point. When we have stand-up comedians in 2022, when you can watch, you know, hop on Netflix, HBO, I I have not seen that many people contend in the literature genre. I I have. There's really funny, like the most funny books that you can imagine. Way better than stand-up comedians. But when I'm looking at what I'm going to read, if I have all of this time. What am I going to read? And what's what's the market like? What's the history of the market? And what's, I mean, we could look at Shakespeare and all these people people writing comedies. And what what do I want? I don't really feel like time well spent is reading a comedy. I, w I would rather, this is what I would rather do. I would rather stretch, you know, roll out on some massage balls and watch and laugh my laugh my ass off at Dave Chappelle or, you know, a comedian that I like. That's it's a really good time or watching it with friends, watching it with your significant, significant other. I try to laugh at least once a day. I try to watch something funny, watch clips of a joke or listen to a podcast. I know it will be funny at least once a day. It's why not? Why not be I'm always smiling. It's, it's fun, but you know, I just don't feel like the literature genre of comedy really is, is it. So next we have comic books and I would graphic novels and I would throw manga, 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 whatever in there also. And I'm very torn on this because there have been a couple on uh, comic books, graphic novels, and m m mangas that have absolutely transformed my life, like are at the top, an S, really, really good. But unfortunately, the industry, if we're really judging the past, the present, and everything else, I am going to have to give, you know, anime, or excuse me, mangas, and comics, and graphic novels a C because nine, 99 out of 100 people who are really into the stuff are using it as a way of escapism. They are using it as a way to not grow, to not transform themselves. And that's, it. it's very weak. The whole culture, the whole thing that has been built around it is not really about growth. It, once again, it's about escapism. And I understand with the graphic novel, with being able to have images, we can tell such a beautiful story. And when it is impactful and the writing is good, it's really good. But most mangas and comics and graphic novels aren't very good. They're not at the level of the Sandman comic series. Full Metal Alchemist, Attack on Titan, those things can transform your life. They can make you think very deeply and feel very deeply. And a lot, of, and I and I should admit that a lot of comics and mangas out there actually do make you feel very deeply, and they help you access deeper emotions. And I guess they're really good for that. So maybe we can give comics and graphic novels a B because even though maybe intellectually they give you nothing, they actually do help you feel a lot. So I I will change my mind on that. That even though all I have a lot of friends and they don't have any intellectual, you know, don't mind me saying this, capacity, and this is all they read, all they read is comics and graphic novels, but they do have a lot of emotional capacity from what they are reading. And, you know, I always tell them, I try to get them to read like really good and transformational comics or man 
ma mangas and they just aren't into it. They just are, you know, and it's, it's whatever, man. But I just, so it gets a B. Okay. Crime and detective, you know, I'm going to give this a C. This is one, this is the same story. I feel like Walter Mosley books or James Elroy books or fuzz by, and I'm trying to remember there is really, really good books, but it has been turned into airport thrillers. It has been turned into crime and detective novels are for old grandmas. Now it, the genre is almost dead. It's for the people who are trying to tap out the, 30 year retirement plan workers. So, and that's fine. But if I'm on a 30 year retirement plan, right? If you say, Ian, Hey man, here's 30 years. And maybe that will happen one day. I am going to try to grow as much as I can when I'm not doing that. I my that job is going to be deafening. And so I'm not going to go on vacation or go home every night and just read more deafening things. I'm going to be trying to turn up the volume and live the most fullest expression of my life and with art and with literature. I'm trying to do the most I can, but the problem is, and this is the problem with all these different things, is that if you do that, pretend you you are that person and you, then you suddenly you become disenfranchised about your job and you want to quit and you get depressed. All these different things start to happen. So I'm very suspicious, and this is going to be a repeated theme throughout this text about the crime and detective genre, because how people treat it, what people are doing with it, what the market is for. But some of the greatest writing, some of the greatest storytelling is happening there. For sure, like I said, I. If you are an aspiring writer, and that's why you have to take it seriously. If you are oh, someone who wants to be a great writer, there is so much to steal. There's so much great stuff to mimic and to imitate and to learn from in crime and detective novels. They really know how to push characters and a plot and dialogue and sex and suspense, all these different things. And it's such a competitive market that they're all actually really good at it. At least a lot of people are actually really good at it. So as a writer, it's, some, it's something I've learned a lot. And I learned that from David Foster Wallace. If you go look at David Foster Wallace, you know, one of the greatest authors of our generation, who is a library at the University of Austin, Texas, there's a lot more than a lot of crime novels in there, a lot of like really mainstream or crime novels. And then you look at his notes in there and it, he's talking about, it. he's taking stuff, he's learning from it and seeing what they do from it. You can learn a lot from it. So next we have Dystopian and I'm going to give Dystopian an A because Dystopian, I feel like really pushes people to grow. It really shows people, it really should create action when it's good. If you look at Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler or Children of, of Men or The Mandibles or, you know, and many, I've, um, Oryx and Crate by Margaret Atwood. I've, I'm a huge fan of dystopian novels. You know, I read them all the time. Those are just some of the ones off the top of my head. They have all made me grasp a different view of the world. They have made me sit there and feel that pit in my stomach, made me feel terrible. You know, when, when something makes you feel terrible, it, can change your it can change your life and i i think that more people should be writing dystopian novels and connecting it to events in the future and it's something that people can resonate with it makes us feel it creates that sympathetic nervous system response that fight or flight response and we love that right we love to have that and that helps promote growth it helps build the vagus nerve as in relation to you know life and everything but also to literature and our aspirations and it does scare us. And I don't like, it. and some people think that, you know, I know people who read dystopian novels and they think it's actually going to come true. And they know how we stop dystopia from happening. We educate people. There is no political solution. There is no religious solution, everybody. I hate to break it to you. You know, whatever political party you're going to vote for isn't going to help because they're going to do things and that's going to cause a pendulum to shift to make other people mad. And it's just going to keep shifting and shifting. The only way to stop that is through education, creating a non-violent society, having people reach the emotional, intellectual, and spiritual level where they stop being violent toward other people in a physical and emotional manner so that it can end the cycle of abuse. That's what we have to start. That's where we have to start. And almost everybody has to be on board and we have to have a justice system to really reflect and get rid of the people who can't really get on board when 99.9% of, of the population is on board. And our society isn't like that today. A lot of people aren't physically violent, but if they are pushed to that, they will be. If I said to you, if you know, if you're out with your wife or your husband or someone, and someone said the worst possible thing, if they were just harassing you and saying the worst possible thing, would you fight them? Would you hit them? If they were just disrespecting you and calling, you know, just whatever the worst possible thing. And a lot of people would. Over half of of uh, the people in America are going to get physical at some point if you taunt them too much. And we have to get rid of that because there will always be a taunter. There will always be a situation. And anyway, that's why I feel like dystopian is so important that it can help us understand where we're going. And it shows you, like I said, when you actually think about it, it doesn't matter what we really do. It doesn't matter if, if you vote Democrat or Republican or if you live somewhere else, it doesn't matter what you do. 
there's always going to be problems until we reach that level. So why not just focus on that problem? Why are we focusing on all these minute problems and these polarized opinions? Like here in America right now, there's all this abortion stuff happening. Who cares? I'm I'm 100% pro-choice, but I don't even care. I'm caring. All I care about right now is educating people so that we can stop the cycle of abuse because that will save more people than focusing or wasting energy on anything else right now. So let's hop into it. Essay. Essays. You know, essays are going to receive a B. There are some great essays out there. I feel like essays are an underrated thing. If, once again, if we want to mention David Foster Wallace, go check out his book, Consider the Lobster, if you want to see some really, really good essays. But once again, essays have been almost or have been taken over by politics, by certain political opinions. There's essays now have very deep political opinions, and it's unfortunate that we, that we can't get back to that level. And a lot of people like to blame the left, and they are to blame, but the right is starting to get into it now. The culture war, the culture war is just getting going. If you thought the culture wars and polarization is bad, now the right is ramping up theirs, and it's only going to get worse. And I feel like the essay is a great place to talk about many different things, and not including politics, but just life in general. If you look at most, you know, and I, you know, honestly, I'm gonna give the essay an A. Oops. The essay and a because if you actually I love reading literature journals and that's what and those are all just essays those are all essays and I, I would consider that some of the most transformational and mind-boggling things you can find in the essay genre so all right fan fiction is going to receive an and it should you know honestly should receive an f but there is a lot of actually really good fan fiction out there and that and there's a lot of young writers trying that and that's why I'm not going to give it an f but the market is saturated you know having Harry Potter erotica uh, gay erotica is great and it's you know it really is great but once again where is the transformation there where is it and people get caught here forever and i feel like fan fiction is for the people i 100 percent believe this fan fiction is for the people who aren't conf confident enough to write fiction or you know just fi the overbroad fi the, the broad uh term of fiction including all the general genres you know crime fantasy science fiction that's why they write fan fiction. Every single person I know who writes fan fiction, when I actually probe a little bit and ask them and get to know them as a person, they have self-esteem issues. And that's probably why they are getting so engulfed in these stories in the first place. It's a very female dominated dominated arena. And as we know that um, I just had three students in my class the other day, I had a, just a total breakdown of, of seventh graders crying about Twilight and who even knew that people were still reading Twilight, but apparently it's still a big deal. And that's cool. And people get really into books and they want to write more about it and live in that world. And like I said, it's a bridge, but a lot of people never cross the bridge or they just are like sleeping on the bridge. Like they never cross the bridge. It's a great way to learn to write. It's an easy way to write. Yeah. And I, I and that's why I think it's, I think it's good, but just, it, when you see adults doing it, when you see people who've been trapped in fan fiction for decades, it's like, oh, this is this is revert. This is not promoting growth at all. So now we have. I don't feel like anyone should be very pissed off. Maybe some people are pissed off about the D for comedy or the C for crime, but fantasy, I'm going to give a B. That fantasy for sure is a very high R. I feel like fantasy has the, even better. And this might be controversial. Better than science fiction. That some very high literary art. And but where it falls short once again is. Where is the merit? Where is the transformation in it? And I feel like once again, a lot of people get lost in the in writing and reading science fiction in, or excuse me, fantasy, in the unicorns and in the in the weird subplots, and it gets very campy, and people love that. And people, but I a couple years ago I went on a fantasy kick and I tried reading all the biggest stuff, and I did. I probably read over a hundred fantasy books, and I felt like a lot of them were just playing on tropes, playing and just writing to market. They weren't really they didn't really have that trend. They something was missing, and that, I feel like science fiction has that something, that potential, that showing us. It, it's almost by creating this totally fantasy world, we get to detach from all of our problems and a lot of human problems. And and when you take that too far, though, we lose sort of the essence of fiction, which is trans. When you finish a book, you should be different than when you started. And when I finish fantasy books, sometimes I'm emotionally manipulated, which is fine, but I'm not really psychologically or politically or whatever i don't i'm not i don't there's not as many transformations in those realms sometimes that human element is missed and sometimes it's not though and that's where fantasy if you look at like the lord of the ring series and others that that's where they go crazy and they actually have more ability than anything else when they sometimes just have this small tether back to the human world so next we have historical fiction and i'm going to give historical fiction also a b you know i'm a fan of books man and i'm going to give some pretty bad ratings today but we're gonna to have to expand the A's and the B's. I think historical fiction is a great genre. I just reread Gene Wolfe's Soldier in the Mist. Soldier, I can't remember what it's called. Soldier in the Mist series. Great series, go check out that. Historical fiction has a lot of merit. And I feel like 
once again, it's one of these genres that a lot of old people get caught in. So I'm, I really feel like it's a low B or a high C, honestly. It's a genre that a lot of people camp in and get caught in, but you can learn a lot about different eras. And I think it has so much merit to research a different era and write about it because it's, once again, we'll talk about this in history and let's just throw history in. I think that history for sure deserves an A. And so we'll just talk about both these at once. If you want to be, once again, this is my opinion, a really educated human, someone who really understands what's happening. You almost have to have just like with literature and the classics, you have to have a whole picture, not a whole picture, but a decent picture of what happened throughout history. And let's say by the time you're 45 or 50 and have read and understand if I told you, hey, what was happening in Asia in the 1200s or in Europe or what was the what was what's the history of South America or the uh, or the Maya? What could you tell me? And you could slowly put that together. You could read a couple history books a year and listen to a couple history podcasts. And you can slowly put everything together over a couple decades. And I feel like that's a very that has a lot of merit to it, like listening to history. And, and I, I really love to listen to history of audiobooks. I listen to them while I'm in yoga every night before bed. I get through at least 10 to 20 history audiobooks a year, then probably another 10 or 20 history books a year if I'm not on a history kick, you know, just as a base level. And I have, I feel like by the age of 28, where I'm at now, put together a nice catalog in my head of world history, of American history, of all different types of history and what I'm interested in. I've, you know, and it's really important. It connects back to historical fiction that then I, certain time periods I'm interested in, like for instance, uh, four or five years ago, I was on the Eastern Front kick. So I read a bunch of um, historical novels about the Eastern Front. Uh, about two years ago, I, I read a bunch of stuff about the Civil War. Then I read a couple of Civil War historical fiction novels. Um, I'm kind of on a Roman Greece kick right now. So I just read about that. I'm reading, you know, a couple historical novels in that realm. It's it's a nice blend of, of it's a nice kind of blend. You read about history, maybe and get a whole time period down. Then you have some fun and read some historical fiction pieces about it and kind of understand, you know, the period a little bit more and the dress and how people acted according to this author. And I, I feel like this is very underrated and it gives people a lot of perspective. And once again, if you understand the motions of history, what I said earlier makes sense that there really are no political or religious solutions. We've been trying those for a long time. And once you factor in technology and the weaponry, that AI weaponry, it's like, all right, we need to slow down, slow the roll here and really build and fix humans to the level of nonviolence, you know? And a lot of people don't like that, you know? But we, So I am going to give Whore a, that once again, I feel like comedy, there's a lot of great things in here, but it's just a form of escapism that these books are great to read. These books are great and there's so much to learn, much like it's a high, I, I'll give Whore a high D and a lot of people get pissed off about this. But I look, how, how, you, how you know, how I'm ranking this at even at the fourth level is, and this is how, what do people, what are the people who read these books? What are they like? And when I think of the people who I know who read horror books, most of the time, and I hate to judge people, most of the time they aren't trying to transform the world. And that's really my standard of life. Are you trying to be an NPC, a non-player character in this simulation? Or are you trying to do something? Are you trying to make an impact? Even if it's small, very small, even if it's something small, and maybe you're building up to it over the course of decades, maybe it's you just being a really good mom or like, you know, something like that. But I feel like a lot of people I know who are really into horror books just fall short of all those markers. They just fall short. And why? Because it's a form of escapism, a form of projecting the libido and uh, fantasizing and moving into de dark, depressive states. And it programs you. We, we don't like to say it, but when you read horror and you watch horror movies, it puts a negative programming within you. And that's fine. I like confronting the shadow. And like, I like horror movies. I like horror books. They're they're, they're wonky. I try to read them every once in a while or watch them every once in a while. They really, they transform you for sure. They can get you out of your shell and like really make you think. But that anxiety, I don't feel like it's healthy all the time. I feel like it's something to have in the bag, much like a comedy book, much like a horror. A horror book is something to have in the bag. But now with the saturation of the, of the market and once again, kind of, you know, just the weird people who are into it. I don't like to stigmatize it, but stigmatize those people but why is it always that those people aren't doing things to transform the world and are to have this darker more reclusive nature to them and having a darker reclusive nature isn't bad but when you're wasting that away on nothing and you can't waste it away on nothing i'm all for wasting your life away on nothing if you are meditating if you are wasting that away in self-contemplation all right that's who you are you were you were born here to not do anything but if you are still trying to be an active participant in society and kind of moving down into those zones and being like that. You know, this may be judgmental of me, but I have just analyzed and thought about people who are into this, into the horror genre. And like I said, it's very 
it's really rare for me to meet people who are really into the horror genre and that makes up a whole part of their catalog to be like i said a person who is really trying to transform themselves and transform others haven't really seen that yet most of the time like i said they're spending a lot of their time up in this these realms in the fiction non-fiction classics dystopian essay and history realm they're really spending a lot of their time up there not down here lit rpg role-playing games all right we're just gonna give that one an f um <laughs> all right memoirs memoirs slash autobiographies i'm going to give this one a i'm going to give this one a b once oh same same in that yeah a b because more so than a biography you can learn about some of the really nuanced things about life we were talking about earlier like for instance david goggins can't hurt me one of the best biographies written in a long time there is so much transformation you can learn in that book about how to change your life that it's unreal how to push yourself and like a lot of it's maybe even unhealthy so yeah i think that memoirs are basically the same thing i was talking about biography a lot of a lot of transformational um potential mysteries i'm going to give a d once again i feel like some great writing here some great things to learn but just doesn't have that just doesn't have that itch man okay philosophy of course is an s you need to read philosophy it is the high art if you want to think and grow and feel i have another book go check out another another tier ranking um video about the branches of philosophy and yeah i feel like philosophy is very important i would recommend the story of philosophy by will durant if you've never read anything about western philosophy before. anyone can read it it's a great book and it will blow your mind you'll see once again so we talked about literature and stories now we, we talked about history understanding thought and the history of thought and ideas is philosophy there's so many people out there who are just neo-kantians or neo-spinozians or weird idealists now and the things that they say and they have no idea that they are that they've been they've just heard that these ideas have just been manufactured and replayed so many times and put on the tv or in rate on you know in music or whatever and people now are into religion or spirituality people are be, being these watered down philosophers and i always say that it's so funny that Imagine, you know, a, the be, a middle school basketball team could beat, that's real, the best middle school basketball team in the country could beat the 1930s NBA champions. You know what I mean? Just because of the skill and technique, you know, even though they're all middle schoolers and they're 11 years old, they could smack them. And that's how, I don't understand how people today aren't smarter than the people who were thinking in, you know, the 16 or 1700s, like, you know, Kant or, you know, uh, Spinoza. How are we not, we, people are still giving watered down versions. They don't even realize. So, Understanding that the history of philosophy gives you the history of thought and then you understand what your ideas are about That's what's really important. You understand where your ideas are coming from Are you are some of your views of the world Platonian or Spinozian or Derridian? Like what where are your ideas coming from and who are you and you have to understand philosophy and really the history of it at a Base level to understand that to really start playing the game of ideas in life And if you don't have that you don't really get to enter the arena if you don't you want to talk deep You want to have deep talks and get all deep about life well, if you don't understand the history of philosophy, then you're just running in circles. You're just, you know, not really making progress or not, you know, or giving out flaws. I hear people all the time having ideas. I'm like, oh, that's been basically disproven 300 years ago. Poetry also receives, of course, an A, an S. And poetry is flooded now, especially. You know, I'm honestly going to give poetry an A because poetry now is a lot worse than what it was poetry at some point was an s it was better than fiction in the early you know until really 1970s and 80s when new york and san francisco schools of thought really polluted it it had a lot of potential but now with identity poetry and diversity quotas in mfa programs and at universities and the political politi politicization of poetry in all the wrong ways people with writing political poems without a being able to write even a good normal poem it's kind of turned into a bit of a shit show and yeah, so poetry in general, I feel like is so valuable that everyone needs to read poetry. The history of poetry is also important. I keep talking about this, understanding it, but just having poetry that speaks to you, it can transform you faster than anything else. You can sit down and read a poetry book in an hour sometimes, and it can literally transform in, in ways you didn't know possible or make you feel very deeply. It can transform you intellectually. It can make you feel deeper, maybe probably than anything on this list. So poetry all the way, man. I have a ton of videos on this uh, channel about poetry. So political books, I'm going to give political books a C. I feel like, once again, they have a lot of potential, but they have just are watered down in the culture wars. That The idea of politics is really, politics is really fun to read about and all the ideas and history. But a lot of the books getting pushed now, especially in 2022, have are just pushing aside. And I just read a great book by a libertarian author. And I'm, I'm an anarchist. I'm apolitical. And I read a great book.
I can't remember the name. It's, it's a guy named uh, Scott. He's a libertarian guy named Scott H or something. He, he had one book like the end of about about the Iraq War and about all that. But this was this he wrote a very anti-war novel, basically talking about how we didn't need to be involved in a lot of the conflicts we're involved in as Americans. Obviously, if you go back to Vietnam, but we've been involved in hundreds of conflicts around the world that you'll never even hear about, like in Somalia and Guatemala and all these random Iran Contra. There's all these random events that have happened and that we've been manipulating in the world and like a political book like that is absolutely amazing it show it really proved an anti-war not proved but really gave a great anti-war perspective and stuff like that's really good but then there's you know just endless books about trump or biden or about the democrats or republicans or about all these different things they're just a waste and really the extremes the extreme books like i said this very 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 anti-war book or maybe a very pro-war book that tells us this is why we need to stabilize these countries and this is why we need though they're very interesting why nation states make the decisions that they do and once again i really don't believe in the concept of government at all because it actually doesn't exist it's just human beings claiming authority and people um then accepting that authority but um and when if we all lived in a peaceful way with the earth and each other we wouldn't need the government and we should be figuring that out with all the money and all the resources that we can but we don't actually care about that because if the government solved that problem it would cease to exist and it was we know and that every pension plan everything you know the military pension plans those would all go away life as we know it you know control all the power all that would cease if we because how you know we don't care is go just go talk to 12th graders who are now graduating it's may everyone's about to graduate see what they've learned see what the trillions of dollars that we you know hundreds of billions of dollars that goes into if not trillions of dollars into education that we spend every single year where does that go what do they know on average a kid spends at around ten thousand hours in school or a couple thousand hours excuse me from middle school to high school where they are conscious and can read and can grow and can think and they come out learning absolutely nothing they learn some math that they forget really fast they can speak and interact kind of but they in that time could have read hundreds of books and transform themselves and learn martial arts and how to defend themselves and how to control their energy or learn yoga and meditation. What do they know? They know absolutely nothing most. And they don't care about life. They just want to get a job. They are there for a job. Their parents went through the same system and everyone just cares about money and stability and security. And it's an absolute mess, man. And that's why I feel like political books, you know, anyway, if you've made it this far into the video, if you're, you know, 30 minutes in, you know, this is a part of me, everybody. Religion, re religious books. I'm going to give religious books a, a B, you know, if we just kind of cut out Honestly, let's just give it a D because if I look at the state of the market, it's mostly Islamic and Christian books and a lot of spiritual books and a lot of them are a waste. There's a ton of really good religious books out there that can transform your life. But, you know, if you are playing, you know, I, I feel like if you are playing on, if you are still believing, if you still believe in Christi Christianity, Islam at a very base level, then you're not really understanding life. That there are people at the, and hear me out here, there are, if you are really pushing the limits of Christianity or um, Islam or Judaism or whatever Hinduism then or Buddhism you can transform your life and you can actually go very deep a lot of people don't I'm sure if you're a Christian out there you understand that a lot of people actually don't read the Bible don't go deeper don't study uh, Christian theory and really try to live the principles and there's just a lot of fake ass Christians and religious people out there and a lot of these books are made for them and that's why it kind of makes you feel a little bit weird and you know I have a very I'm very anti-religious but once again I understand the merits of religion and see good in it and for people to actually participate in it and go deep into it. There is transformation in there and that's fine. But I feel like a lot of the books really aren't promoting that. It's really, you know, so even judging from that level, there's not very much in there. Religious fiction, I'm an F. Romance, okay. Romance, here we go, everybody. Romance. So <sighs> romance is going to get a D. Once again, it just look core, core. Comedy, horror, mystery, and romance. Those are like basically if I look and thriller, and we'll just throw a thriller in here too. We'll just talk about them all right now. These are the big, those are the big ones, right? These are these are the big genres that once again are really good and have a lot of great writing and a great potential, and they're really fun to read. And you should read them a couple times a year. Like you should read a comedy book, a horror book, a mystery book, a romance book, and a thriller at least once a year, for sure, if not a couple, if you read a lot. But in terms of ranking them, what is thriller ranked? How do we compare thriller to philosophy? If philosophy is at the top, that's the pinnacle, everything, and that's like the high standard. Thriller, thrillers have absolutely nothing on the history of philosophy or literary fiction or nonfiction or the classics. So that's what that's why these are down here. And romance, once again, I feel like is a place where you can go and learn about emotion and depth, but it's really a place where people get manipulated into the idea of romantic love. Go watch my video on titled We the Psychology of Romantic Love if you want a full breakdown on this. But 
40% of marriages end in divorce and people have terrible relationships because they think that this is how relationships work in these romance novels. And a lot of times people are older and they have a shit, a crappy love life. People, sometimes people read romance because they have a crappy love life and they aren't very happy. So they read it for that energy or they don't have that and they read it for that. And I really feel like romance novels are manipulating us and what we need to feel in our relationships. I feel like love is spontaneous and great and it goes up and down. Sometimes you fall out of romantic love and back into it, but core love is always there. Love has nothing really to do with love potion love. It That's there sometimes, but other times it's not. But you should, should still be having hot, hot, passionate sex with your partner and getting into the, you know, you know, growing with them sexually or even if it, even if romantic love isn't there, like I know so many, like, you know, it's so crazy. I know we're just kind of, this is all these videos are kind of off topic. I know so many dudes out there that don't ask their wives what they actually want. And so many wives out there that won't, you know, there isn't talk on both ends. Like, Hey, what should we do? You know what we should be doing? I know this might be, I'm just dropping controversy here talking about anti-religious and we should be trying to have the most extraterrestrial orgasms we can because those transformation, I know this is crazy. That if you have, think about the best orgasm you ever had in your life. Think if that was a hundred times better. How would that feel? Would that make you feel a certain way or show you new depth of life? That is possible. For, unless you've, uh, for people who just, you know, stick it in the hole or, you know, do the, the, the rubby rub or <laughs> not to, not to get, you know, go all crazy here. There are, there are profound limits. If you learn Tantra or you get into sex toys or experiment with psychedelic drugs to orgasms and to depth and emotions. And, and you have to, most of the time you have to have that with another human being. You have to have a, a, a partner in the rodeo to do that with. And it's better, not a random person. It's better with someone you've known for years who knows exactly who you are to give you that and to help you with that. And once again, that, that, that has nothing to do with romantic love. That has to do with understanding and empathy and romantic love can make that better. And it can help that. And it can help push that forward. But once again, I know so many people who never talk about that and never experience that because they feel weird or they've been programmed. It's so funny, man. It's so funny, but that has to do with the romance. I feel like a lot of that is projected satire. I'm just going to give satire an F. I don't know people who read satire. Science fiction is going to receive an A and that it looks like is going to be, yeah. Science fiction for sure receiving an A because I feel like it isn't maybe the writing maybe sometimes falls short, a little bit shorter than fantasy, but I feel like the ideas and the human connection and the transformational connection is really good. That science fiction books like Hyperion and Dune and others are absolutely can absolutely transform your life and your thinking that they can make you a better person. They can help you grow as a human being and science fiction authors are really, really into it and they take it very seriously. Fantasy people, I feel like are campy sometimes and they get into you know, Dungeons and Dragons and role playing and all these things. Science fiction people no, they are in it. They are weird. They dive deep and they are in the game and that's why it is receiving an a next we have self-help books and a lot of people may think that i like self-help books and i actually do and i'm going to give self-help books a b a lot of the time self-help books aren't very helpful but if you read enough of them you'll find enough techniques and things that you'll be able to use and it just helps you keep motivated i read self-help all the time and i don't really implement very much but it helps me keep on the path it helps me keep motivated it helps me understand myself and what is happening and you just have to find the right people don't settle for the big people out there or like the weird weird people you know there are a ton of like for instance i would go read cal newport's books anything by cal newport deep work for instance uh the one thing by gary keller anything by uh linchpin or uh shipping the uh the new shipping book by seth godin go read some of those books those are some of the greatest self-help books they can transform your life i mean if we're talking about straight personal transformation books they are in the self-help genre but there are so many terrible self-help books out there too. So you need to make sure to do your research, find the best ones out there. I just named three authors right there. Cal Newport, Gary Keller's book, The One Thing, and Seth Godin's Lynchpin. Go read those and your, your life will be transformed. So short stories. I am going to give short stories a B also. I feel like short stories are underutilized, underrated. Uh, the, the New York school, once again, has kind of ruined short stories at some level, but they are 100% viable. Go read Burn Man, uh, uh, Burn Man on Texas Porch by Ant Mark Anthony Jarman, if you can find it anywhere. If you want to see the level that short, I'm sure you know the level that short stories can go. Short stories are really good and I really enjoy them. And I feel like they have a very great and rich core. Textbooks are going to receive an F. I never really see the point of a textbook. I feel like you can learn a lot of these things without a textbook. What do I mean by that? You know, you don't need math, a math textbook to learn math anymore. You know, you don't need a science textbook. You should, we should be reading 
books, like individual books for history class. If you think about it, if you start learning history in like the seventh grade when we're smart enough, but kids aren't smart enough anymore. That's the problem. The kids aren't smart enough anymore. People, you know, parents suck now. That's basically it. We can't really do this. Westerns are going to receive, go into this D category. Same, same thing. Um, young adult is going to receive an E. I feel like young adult for people under the age of 18 receives an A or a B, but young adult in general, I know I, I have a weird feeling and this is crazy that more people I know who read young, I, I, you know, I'm a middle school teacher. I taught high school. Most of my kids who I know who read in middle school and high school don't read young adult. Uh, probably about half of them read young adult, but I know so many adults that read young adult and I don't understand why people, you know, when you have the whole list up here, everything from C and up, why you'd be reading young adult. And that's why it's getting an E I get, it has this capacity, but you want the highest emotional capacity. Go up here. If you want the highest storytelling, go up here. Like everything is like kind of, it's almost like one of those things, like I said, that people just want to tune out with. Crave nonfiction is going to receive a B because I feel like Crave nonfiction is a really good, really good medium. Like I said, consider the lobster by, um, I, that's what probably is, instead of an essay, Crave nonfiction is, you know, consider the lobster by David Foster Wallace. There's a lot of good stuff here. So if you guys are interested in watching my breakdown of the of classic novels go check that out right here and then on the other side you're going to see my breakdown of the branches of philosophy subscribe and i'll see you guys later peace